<laughs> where I live. It's kind of fun seeing where people live. <laughs> I live. I, I, I'm happy. To, that's my gar my vegetable garden, which is not busy yet. Well, it's going to be covered in snow tomorrow anyway. So. Yeah. Right. <laughs> and I still have snow in the corner of the field. That's how far up I'm at. 1500 feet altitude. So we, we usually have we're, snow we're, longer than most folks. We're still in a, a winter wonderland here. So. Yeah. So, but I'm just glad. glad. I mean, uh, for a long time, I didn't think I could do this. Right. But I have like a 50 foot long phone cord and my Wi Fi routers onto the porch. I had to set up this whole uh, <laughs> thing with what noodles on the floor, <laughs> all of this to work, but it worked. So we got it to. So I could be outside and my family can make dinner without worrying about all the pots and pans. And <laughs> all right. Well, I just want to let everyone know that we're going to get started here um, with intro to science topics with Bar Bobby Farley's Rubio. And he's doing it from outside, which I'm very impressed by. Um, <laughs> and uh, we'll, we'll go ahead and get started. And as people join us, I'll, I'll let them in. <laughs> all right. Well, it's so nice to be back with you folks. Um, it's so nice to have this weather. I'm, I'm in the light of an actual star right now. So we've been doing a lot of astronomy. Never forget that this sun is a star. And when it shines on us, we can't see the rest of the stars. But um, I'll, before I get going on what we're going to be talking about, um, did any of you have a chance to play around with Stellarium in the last week? I'm hoping that some of you were able to find out cool things you could do. I was, I figured out how to turn off those meteors <laughs> and I figured out other cool things that are in there. You can add and take away satellites. Um, there are these plugins that you may, you may be familiar with that word because it's used in a lot of other software, but there are plugins for Stellarium that you can get that allow you to see satellites, the meteor showers. You can actually add things in that we have in the planetarium like the Sloan Digital Sky Survey so you can, you know, get some real deep data sets and include them in the sky that you use in Stellarium. So did anybody find out? Did anybody try that? Did anybody do those things? I hear too early of the year to hear crickets. <laughs> ah, well, it's okay. I just want you to make that a goal for yourself. Not that you need to learn this program for because it's Stellarium, but because Stellarium is a great, uh, op, you know, a great tool for for knowing what's in the sky. And for those of you that borrowed a telescope, this is the thing that I always use as a complement to when I'm using the telescope, so I know what I'm looking at. And one more thing about Stellarium is that there is a a night vision mode that you can hit a button and it causes everything to be reddish. So instead of having blues and whites, everything is tinted red. Um, it's similar to the screen that we use in the planetarium when we're we're doing our classes. You know, we look at the iPad and it's all red so that we don't lose our night vision. And if you're out there with a telescope looking at the stars, if you look at a bright computer screen, you might blind yourself. So the Stellarium has a thing built in so you can maybe put on a laptop, take it out with you in the telescope and sort of like, uh, you know, match what you're seeing in the telescope with what's in Stellarium, and then you could learn more about it. You could select on the object and find out how far away it is. Uh, you could find out how many light years and, you know, and other things like that. If you want to look at a star, you could find out what color that star is and its actual composition compared to the sun. So there's a lot that you can do with astronomy and Stellarium. It's an incredibly powerful piece of software. And yes, we're going to get into it now. So I'm going to share my screen with you guys. And there's Stellarium. I hope everybody can see it clearly. And that uh, red eye function that I was talking about, the, that night mode is right here. And one thing that you're gonna wanna use if you get familiar with Stellarium is, do you see where it says night mode? There's also that little command and N. There's a lot of things that you can do with Stellarium without uh, using the mouse, just by using the keyboard. Like there's a button to advance the day. In fact, it's the plus and the minus on the keyboard. Advance one day in the future or one day in the past, plus for one day in the future, minus for one day in the past. So you could do that um, with a touch of a button. And that's what I recommend you learning if you get into Stellarium. Otherwise, you know, it'll take you a lot longer to navigate your way around. So I'm using the arrow keys now and I'm making the sun visible. But the I other thing I can't see Stellarium. I can't see Stellarium. You're not seeing the sun in the sky? Leela, can you see it? Yeah, you should be able to. He's sharing his screen right now. I accidentally hit my, I accidentally hit a button on, 
I have all these selections of who I want to see, and I accidentally hit my own, and it booted me out of Stellarium. Okay, so the, the, find the button. There's It might be gallery view. That might be the mode you want to get into where you can see all the screens. That, can you find I, that? I don't know where it is. Okay, relax, buddy. It's no, it's no, uh, no, 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 no danger here. So, um, so look at the top bar, and you might notice that there's different shapes. One of them looks like a lot of squares, like nine little squares bunched together. I, I don't see that. Okay, you I'm trying to match. I'm trying to see if so. on mine it says swap shared screen. So at the very top, so I don't know if, if you don't. Maybe if I, let me, uh, well, let's see for Taylor's sake. I'm gonna stop the share. I stopped sharing Stellarium. Can you see me now, Taylor? Yes, I've been able to see you since I accidentally hit my button and I switched back to you. Okay, I'm gonna share the screen again. Let's hope that you can see. Can you see Stellarium yes. this time? Yes. Okay, so don't hit any buttons, buddy. All right. <laughs> okay, everybody's all together now. If you do have a problem, please let us know. I'd rather help you fix the problem than go on and assume that you can see it and you can't. So um, now here is the sky as it would be right now. And there is a button on the bottom of Stellarium that shows you how to make it right now. It's that triangle pointing down. Um, but instead of looking for these buttons, I've just memorized the fact that J, K, L are, those are all three letters right next to each other on the keyboard. And if you play video games, this won't surprise you at all. Uh, J, K, L are, are directionals and L will fast forward you through time. K will return you to normal time, like set one second per second. And then J will take you back in time. So I'm gonna hit L uh, two times and you'll see now the seconds are ticking by quickly. I'm gonna hit it again. And then one more time. And I hope everybody can see that the sun is heading towards the Western horizon. You might not get a perfectly smooth animation because of our internet connections, but I hope that the picture is becoming clear for you. We're looking at the evening sky and then a K on the keyboard and now time returns to normal. And this is 713, which is actually about 10 minutes before the actual sunset time. Um, no, our trees don't have leaves yet, <laughs> but there's only so many backgrounds I can use on this program. But now, as you see, I'm passing the sunset time it's only a few minutes after sunset and already something has become visible. I hope all of you know what it is. Who's gonna shout it out? What's that dot over there? A UFO? Venus. Moon. Oh, thank you, it's Venus. Wait, who said moon? Cause you're not totally wrong. Last night and tonight will be a moon that will be rising at the same time as the sunset. But notice tonight the moon isn't up yet. Um, by definition, if you want to know how to think of a full moon as relative to the sun, the sun and the, and the moon have to be on opposite sides of the sky for the moon to look full. In fact, you know, you can kind of see that with my hand, if the sun is on the opposite side, you can see my hand fully. But if my hand is over here, see, it has like a crescent hand. <laughs> you only see a little bit of the light. I've made a crescent hand. All right, about that. So in the annals of astronomical teaching. So... If I'm over here, you see the full hand, right? And so it makes sense that the moon and the sun have to be on opposite sides of each other to be visible. But last night, the moon rose a lot earlier than it will tonight. So when people talk about full moons, they usually think it's one night, but really the moon look, looks full for about three nights. So, so not ignore it, let's fast forward a little bit through time and notice when we see the moon rise in Stellarium. Uh oh, is wait a second, something's wrong. Somebody shrunk my moon? No, that's Arcturus, a star we talked about. So where is the moon? It hasn't risen yet? It's so late. All right, it's already 8.15, still not up. Ah, oh, is that it? Yes. Now, don't be disappointed. In Stellarium, the moon looks really small, but that's actually scale size. So how come when we look at the full moon, in our imagination, it looks like this. That's sort of a mental zoom. Your brain has the ability to perceive things larger than they actually are based on their importance and based on how bright they are relative to the surroundings. So in a weird way, looking at the moon, 
your brain kind of makes it look bigger than it actually is. But can you tell that the moon is a little less than full? Even in Stellarium, you see that. It won't rise until about 8.30, which means about an hour after the sun sets. And it's a little less full. So last night was the fuller moon or the fullest moon. Tonight's almost a full moon, but it's getting close to when we would call it a waning gibbous. But uh, this came up yesterday during my public planetarium shows. Does anybody know one of the funny names for this full moon? It's a little confusing because people expect it to be a particular color. Okay. Do we get somebody uh, get a question in there, Leela? I can't see it. Let's see. Oh, it was the pink moon. Oh, oh Leela wrote that. Come on, you got to give the kids a chance. The I thought, well, you said it, it wasn't a color. So I was like, well, I, all I had heard was it was a pink moon. <laughs> Wait a minute, Seamus. The uh, blood moon? The magenta moon. The magenta. <laughs> well, okay. This is a little bit confusing. Blue. Just like how blue moon in modern times does not mean the moon is actually blue. The pink moon is not named after the color, but actually a plant. Uh, well, um, let me stop for a second here. So have you ever heard of a plant called grass pink, also known as Detford pink? It's a little early blooming flower that actually doesn't really bloom here yet but it will in a couple of weeks maybe a month from now but i just wanted to pull up the page so you guys can know that there is a pink plant that you can look for that if you lived in places like uh in germany or france or britain right now it would be blooming um and let me show you that page this is the wikipedia page for the plant called pink grass pink or deptford pink have you ever seen it before Leela, do you recognize that plant it's, it's a flower that looks like it's growing on a blade of grass. The, the plant itself is very slight. So that's why it looks like grass with a flower. It's like a weird combination. Um, but that is something that blooms in Europe during this time. But that's not something that was named by people whose culture came from here. Does anybody know what the Native American name for the moon that we have right now is? It's a little bit more appropriate to our landscape. I wonder sap if anyone's... moon. What's that? The sap oh, that, moon. That was the sap last moon. full moon. No, that was the last full moon, which was the sap moon. Oh. Which, the which is correct. This one is the worm moon. <laughs> well, think of what's happening outside. You got the oh, mud yeah, the blowing, the ground is thawing. So sap comes first, and then the worm moon, and then the next one that we'll have, it'll be the flower moon which that one does not really need any explanation to me. It's the time we have the most flowers. Oh, Lily just joined us and Matthew too. Great. Yes, there, yep. All right. So we got the flower moon anyway. I won't go on too far, but just so you know, after the flower moon, it's the buck moon. Strawberry moon. Oh, wait. Strawberry, strawberry moon. moon. No, those are, now that is that is the same as the, the, the flower moon too. Anyway, I got to go get a list. I might have some of them mixed up, but... Now, in when we look at those moon lists, there's two sources. There's one that comes primarily from European cultures, and there's one that's generalized to Native American cultures. But to be honest, I've never done the research to find out how specific the Native American cultures ones are, because in reality, there are 535 different Native American cultures in America. Do you think all 535 use the same names for the moons? Probably not. No. no. So I would love to find out and if any of you want to do that as a, a special project, a little bit of research, uh, moon names, it's a cool thing. In fact, my, my lady, my partner, she made a quilt uh, that, that was going to, it was called Moon Over the Mountain. And each of the frames of the quilt was going to have the moon themes based on those names. And so for the hunter's moon, she found uh, some bright orange camo, which I thought was kind of funny <laughs> for the hunter's moon, because it looks like clouds in front of a, a bright orange moon. Um, so anyway, Let's get back to Stellarium. And please, I want to hear questions from everybody. So don't hesitate to interrupt what we're talking about at any moment so that we can answer your question. So there is the moon rising, not quite the full moon, but let's go back over towards the West because guess what? Venus, as many of you correctly guessed, will still be easy to see an hour after sunset. But by the time it gets this dark, you'll notice that Venus is right next to something that I hope everybody can tell me what it is. The Pleiades. The Pleiades, the seven sisters. 
It's a Subaru cluster. Now, let me show you something. Let's see if I can select the actual cluster itself. There we go. Okay. Six stars is what most people can see. Seven stars if you are out of light pollution from a city and you have really good eyes and you eat lots of carrots, right? But um, if you take a telescope, and I'm thinking of particularly uh, Rainy and Rose, if you have your telescope well, before this disappears from the sky, look what will happen when you point a telescope at the Pleiades cluster. Oh, whoa. You should that, so. Yeah, it's a lot of sisters. <laughs> and wow. it's not incorrect to call them sisters in a sense, uh, because in a cosmic way, these stars are all sisters. So just the, the short explanation is that this is an open cluster. And do you see how in between some of the bright stars, you can see little pieces of gas, like clouds of wisp, right? You see that? Yeah. Mm -hmm. That's uh -huh. the gas that's left over from what was one super massive star that would have been in that part of the sky millions of years ago. And it had a colossal supernova and it exploded and it had enough gas in it that its remains have been recycled into 600 stars. So what we call the seven sisters should be called the 600 sisters, right? It's a big family and Last they're all- Yeah, they're all literally descended from one parent star. So think about it that way. Those sisters are truly sisters in that they came from one parent that created the material that made them. And when you see it, you see just the six or seven brightest members of that cluster. It's pretty cool, but you can see that there's a lot of space in the middle of it. You could actually fly through it, you know, without hitting a star. There's a lot of space in between them. And you'll see that that's a different kind of cluster from what we would call a globular cluster, which you will also get to see. But I wanna talk about something that you don't need a telescope to see with Pleiades and Venus. So remember I told you that you can go back in time with just a click of a button using the plus and minus can take you back a day. But to make this easier for everybody, I'm gonna put up the calendar here so you can see that this is tonight, April 8th. And if I go back, look carefully, I'm gonna, let me center Venus and the Pleiades for you guys. Look at the Pleiades. Look at what it says for the eighth and watch what happens when I go to the seventh. Tell me what happened last night. Did you see the change? Anybody notice? I'm gonna go back to two nights ago. No, anyone notice? Okay, that was Monday night. Here's Sunday night. Here's last Saturday. Mm -hmm. And notice they're getting closer uh, together. Yeah. On last Friday, unfortunately, uh, for almost all of Vermont, it was too cloudy for us to see this. I was hoping to see this really badly because this is a very auspicious event. Venus will touch the, the Pleiades, will be right in front of them exactly every eight years. And this is something that's very precise. But since we missed it, it was cloudy. We're going to have to wait till 2028 <laughs> to see this happen again. I'm sure nowadays you can find pictures online of people who saw it happen and photographed it. Oops, I jumped forward. Oh, hold on a second. I accidentally messed up the alignment there. But what I really want you to notice is how cool that is, how much it changed in just a few days. Since last Friday to today, Venus went from there to there. So does anybody have any questions about this? I hope you do. Why is oh, what if it's cloudy again, eight years from now? <laughs> Miss it again. Welcome. <laughs> Welcome to New England astronomy. It's a lot of hopefulness. It's a, it's a very optimistic endeavor. But not not and not to get too far afield, but if there's any story that you should know about somebody who is willing to take an enormous sacrifice in order to observe something in the sky, you need to look up the French nobleman. His name was Guillaume Le Gentil. And Guillaume Le Gentil was, well, he was a wealthy guy. He was able to buy a ship and he wanted to observe something that happens only every 117 years or so. It's called the transit of Venus. 
Venus, the same planet we're talking about, very rarely crosses right in front of the sun. It was first predicted by Johann Kepler in the 1500s. Um, he didn't get to see it, but a, a choir boy named Jeremiah Corax in England was the first person to witness this in the 1600s. He actually set up a telescope, almost went blind looking at the sun and found Venus traveling in front of the sun. So by the time he made the announcement that it was true that Venus could do that, it, the next time it happened was in the 1700s. And in the 1700s, Guillaume Le Gentil, he says, ah, I want to see this. So he, he found out that the only place you could see it was from Madagascar. So he buys a ship and it gets a crew and goes on a journey from France all the way around Africa to Madagascar. He moves it, moves it with the lemurs for a few days. And then he set up a telescope to look at the transit of Venus. And right as he's about to see this event, the British Navy shows up because there was a war going on. The French and Indian War, the Seven Years War, a French ship sighted by a British ship would get sunk or get shot. So he had to take the telescope apart, pack it up and get on the ship and sail away knowing that he lost his opportunity to see the transit of Venus. But he knew based on astronomical calculations that it was gonna happen again eight years later. So it's a weird thing. It happens once and then it happens again eight years later and then you have to wait 117 years to see it happen. So guess what? Guillaume Le Gentil said, well, I've got this ship. I'm in the Indian Ocean on the Ma Madagascar. The next one will be visible from the Philippines, which is only a few hundred miles away. But instead of waiting uh, and going back to France, I'm going to go into business. So he started selling cargo and shipping cargo around the Indian Ocean, waiting eight years. Then he finally gets his moment. He sails to the Philippines. No British warships are coming. He sets up his telescope. And guess what happens? It got cloudy. <laughs> So after all that, Guillaume Le Gentil spent, spent nearly a decade out at sea trying to see something in the sky, never got to see it at all. And then when he gets back home to France, guess what? He's been declared legally dead. And all of his relatives have taken all of his belongings because everybody thought that he had died. So he has to go to a court and sue and prove I'm not dead. I'm actually still alive. So. If you think you're going to be bummed out by missing Trent, the Venus going in front of the Pleiades because it gets cloudy, at least you're not Guillaume Le Gentil. At least people aren't going to declare you dead and steal all your stuff. So it could be worse. All right. So and I'm sorry that story took a lot longer than I expected, but that's dedication. That's spending all that time on a ship to see something that is very rare. We got to see the transit of Venus at the Fairbanks Museum in 2012. We set up telescopes at MVRH and I was able to see it. And I'm glad I didn't get declared legally dead and have to sail the world for 10 years <laughs> to see that. But that's how cool stuff in the sky is. It's worth going through all that trouble to see. So going back to what happened with Venus, let me it looks like there's a question just um, asking why it, Venus moves in front of the sun every eight years and then 117. So it looks okay. like there's... Oh, so you're, the transit of Venus has gotten your attention. Well, great, Sadie. I see that's you, the one who asked the question. So the planets go around the sun in what seems like a plane. We call that the ecliptic. When we talked about the zodiac, we're talking about the line that the planets seem to follow through the stars. That's the ecliptic. The problem is the planets are not perfectly aligned on that ecliptic. If, if Venus and the Earth were perfectly on the same plane of orbit, then we would see transits of Venus every year. It would happen all the time because Venus and us would be on the same line. But imagine if this is the sun, when Venus travels in front of the sun, most years it's either below the sun by a couple degrees or, or above the sun. But for it to line up, right where the sun is it has to be we have to both be in a particular part of our orbit for this to happen so it's very fussy orbital dynamics but it's pretty cool to think that somebody was able to calculate it in the 1500s johann kepler he died before he could see it but his calculations were so good that he predicted something that we still could use his calculations to predict again and again for the future so if you use the math that Mr. Kepler did back in Germany in the 1500s, his math would be, have been able to predict the one that happened in 2012. That's pretty cool. That's one of the things about astronomy. Can you see why people who studied the sky were often thought to be able to see the future, like astrologers and fortune tellers? Because if you know when the next eclipse is going to be, maybe you know when the next war is going to be. 
And that's how ancient peoples used to think of the sky as a sort of a, a way to read the future. Scientists don't look at it that way anymore, but you can predict things like eclipses and transits for thousands of years into the future because the planets are like the gears of a clock and their, their movements are very predictable all the way for thousands of years. So I hope that satisfies your question, Sadie, but if you want the actual orbital, orbital dynamics, you're gonna need somebody like you know the late, great Catherine Johnson who just died. That was her kind of job. She could give you the math and show you exactly uh, why this happens the way it does. I'm not that gifted with the math, but I can explain that it's all about the orbit and the angle and how many degrees off we are from alignment with each other. So any other questions or I wanna go back to Stellarium. Oh, the, the speaking of sun and the clouds came. Oh no, my observations are ruined. And now outside is not as warm as it was when I started. So hold on a second, I have to zip up my jacket. So I wanted to talk about a different kind of time in astronomy. Does anybody uh, in the audience, and Seamus, you're probably the one who knows the answer, so hold off until, give everybody else a chance. But does anybody know which ancient civilization was the first to figure out all these things about Venus? Like how long it took to, to move through the sky? It was a civilization that was famous for having a triple calendar. They had a sun calendar, a moon calendar, and a Venus calendar. The Maya calendar. Yes, the Mayans. So it's a crazy thing about the Mayan uh, culture. In ancient Mayan culture, in, you know, this is the culture that's from Mexico. Like if you ever go to a place like Chichen Itza or um, Tikal, uh, these are ancient cities that archaeologists have found more recently, but come from a civilization that had its peak around 2000 years ago. And during the time of the ancient Mayan civilization, they calculated the orbit of Venus so well that they knew about this thing that I was talking about. Venus going in front of the Pleiades, or they didn't call it the Pleiades. I wish I knew what they called the Seven Sisters, but I've actually seen the, the Mayan uh, glyph, the like, like hieroglyphics for Egyptians, the glyph from the Mayans for Venus looks like a bright star. They had a particular symbol that meant Venus. And in their calculations, they knew that Venus would do this exactly every eight years. So one of the cool things about the Mayan calendar is because every date was based on where the sun was, where the moon was, and where Venus was in their orbits, every, every particular date had a name. And it would take, if I'm not mistaken, something like 66 years before a particular date would repeat itself. So imagine that, like, you know, I mean, my birthday is January 7th, but there's a January 7th every year. So January 7th isn't a special date. But what if, you know, I, I was born on the day of, uh, I don't know, Uzakalul. And Uzakalul is a, is a special day that doesn't happen for 66 years. That would be kind of cool. Your birthday would feel like a holiday because you would have to wait till you're a very old person for your exact birth date to repeat itself. Of course, you had the sun calendar and the moon calendar and the Venus calendar. But as far as ancient civilizations, there were none that were as good at marking time as the Mayans. And there's a cool thing that happens when you observe Venus over a long period of time. Let me show you a little bit about this by adding one more element to our picture here. So there's Venus. Can you guys recognize the context, by the way? I hope you remember that Venus and uh, the Pleiades are right now where Taurus is. There's Orion. There's the big dog and the little dog. So I know we've covered this in the past. I don't want to cover it too much, but if you need me to uh, touch you up on these particular constellations, I can. But remember that there's another concept in the sky that we call the ecliptic, the zodiac line. See that line that just appeared? You see how Venus is close to that line, but not exactly on that line? And think of what that name is, ecliptic. It's, it means the, the place where the eclipses happen. So if the moon is on that line and it's a new moon, we'll have a solar eclipse. If the moon is on that line and it's a full moon, we'll have a lunar eclipse. So think about a transit like the transit of Venus. Venus is not on that line, but if it was exactly on that line, then Venus would be causing a transit next time it goes in front of the sun, but that doesn't happen and it won't happen again 
I'm sorry to tell you this, kids, until 2117. So if you missed the one in 2012, eat lots of fiber and vegetables. <laughs> Have a healthy life and you might get to see it. <laughs> Who knows? <clears throat> The, the scientists have said that the person who might live to be 200 might already be alive today. And let's hope that our health uh, and you know medicine advance so far that many of you will get to see the 2117 transit of Venus. I'm not going to predict the future. But did we have any questions from anybody before I go on? Because I want to show you something else. Um, oh, Rome? Do you, uh, what do you mean about Rome, Matthew? Elaborate on your question. Are you talking about the civilization that was the best at studying the orbit of Venus? Yeah, I think it, it was what you were talking about with the Mayans, but he yeah. was asking. Ah, he was guessing Rome. Well, yeah. let me give you a, an, a comparison. Um, Venus has also often been called the evening star. Perhaps you've heard that. And, and also, when it's visible at other times, the morning star. But from what I've understood, the cultures of the Mediterranean, including the Egyptians and the Greeks and the Romans, they didn't really think that it was the same object, the one that they saw in the evening, than the one they saw in the morning. Mm -hmm. they, got, they they Because they're separated by many days, you won't see Venus for a long period of time. I guess they assumed that it was something else that was on the morning side than what was on the evening side. So as far as they know, the first ancient culture to understand that Venus on the morning side and Venus on the evening side was the same thing were the Mayans. Now, right now, Venus is acting like the evening star, and you see it for the couple of hours after the sun sets. But then just think about what Venus is doing. It's a planet going around the sun. So a few weeks from now, Venus is going to get so close to the sun that we won't be able to see it anymore. It'll disappear in the light of the sun. And that is a period that can last as little as 50 days, sometimes more. It depends on which one is on the far side or the near side. So when it's on the near side, in between us and the sun, it disappears for about 50 days. And then it appears on the other side of the sun, but you're not going to see it in the evening. You'll only see it in the morning. And apparently that time period was enough for people to not realize it was the same thing, except for the ancient Mayans. I don't know how they figured it out before anybody else, but we know that they had great observatories. They built several buildings that were meant just to observe things like this. So it's a culture that we definitely need to study more as a society because they have even more stuff to contribute to our knowledge of ancient times. But let me skip uh, out of Stellarium for a second. I'm going to show you a picture uh, that I've used in another class, unless there's a question to answer, Leela. Anybody have a question or something they want to say? I want to hear from you guys, please. I don't see anything right now, but yeah, there. keep my eyes peeled. All right, because I'm trying to pull up a slideshow. This is actually from an old astronomical test textbook. This is the kind of thing that you would see if you were more like an ancient astronomer. So hold on, let me see if I can uh, share this with you guys right now. All right, so check out these two diagrams. This is from an old textbook written in the 1960s or 70s. So the dates from the observation were actually made in the 50s. But somebody plotted how Venus moves relative to the sun in, in different dimensions. So if you look carefully at the top picture, you can see that they started the observation in April of 1956, April like now. And then by May of 1956, can you see that Venus had moved closer to the sun? And then see the six for June, see the seven for July. So you see that 50 day period between July and June was when Venus was going in front of the sun. Okay. And then it became a morning star. And then after that, it went back to being an evening star later on in 1957. So can you see, can you follow that line? Starts on the top left and goes sweeping down in front of the sun, but didn't go in front of the sun. It didn't cause a transit. And then it goes up and loops around and then it's back again. Now, isn't that weird? How come the planet does that weird little thing? Isn't the planet just going in a regular, even orbit? around the sun does any I, this i need somebody to answer why do you think it looks like venus is riding a roller coaster does venus spin backwards so the sun rises in the west and isn't it isn't its days you know longer than its year 
Seamus, both of those things are true. Just to repeat it, because Seamus' audio quality is a little uh, hard to hear. Seamus said that Venus has the sun rising in the west and setting in the east. Yes, Venus's rotation is backwards from the earth, but it's also a very slow rotation. I don't have the number on top of, on the top of my head, but yes, it takes Venus longer to spin one time than it does for Venus to go around the sun one time. So on Venus, a year is shorter than a day, and the day is very slow, but it also runs backwards from the way that Earth does. But I'm glad you pointed that out, Seamus. But neither of those things actually explain the roller coaster effect that I'm talking about. <laughs> so, so nice try, buddy. But that's something, something that you would notice if you were on Venus and you wouldn't want to be on Venus because it's 900 degrees Fahrenheit, sulfuric acid rain. You wouldn't be able to see anything in the sky. You'd be dead. Venus so. speeds up and slows down. Does ah. that have something to do with it? I, it sounds like young Kepler's over there because yes, planets do speed up and slow down depending on where they are in their orbits. And it tends to be that when they are farthest from the sun, they're going the slowest. And when they're closest to the sun, they're going the fastest. But that's not what explains what's going on in this picture. So just for just for a little bit of, a, uh, you know, to think about this right now, the Earth is actually moving really fast compared to how it was in the winter. As we go from winter to spring, the planet actually speeds up its orbit around the sun. Can you tell? We're going like a few hundred miles an hour faster than we were in the winter. <laughs> we're going about 67,000 miles an hour. I know it doesn't feel like it because I'm just sitting out here on the porch, but that's how fast the planet is moving on average, 67,000 miles an hour around the sun. Venus moves even faster because Venus is closer to the sun. So it has to move faster to not fall in. And so the times when Venus is at its fastest would be um, the, the long, uh, well, I don't want to go too far into this, but Johann Kepler was the person who figured out that planets do not orbit in perfect circles, but instead of they orbit in ellipses, an oval shape. And if you can see the oval that I'm making with my hands on the camera screen, uh, you guys can see that too. You can still see me, right? Mm -hmm. Well, think of the, the, this part as the part where the planets go slowest. And think of this part where my fingers touch as the places where the planets go fastest. Does this remind you of like a race car track? Because it's the same thing with race cars. When they're going down the straightaway, whee, they go a lot faster than when they're going around the bends. And so in a funny way, planets and race cars have that in common. We go fastest on the straightaway, we slow down, we go around the corner, and that corner is not as, as, as it's a lot more subtle than this because if you look at an orbit, it still looks round. It's just slightly elliptical, slightly out of round. So I love your guesses. Rainy and Rose, the planet does speed up and slow down, but it doesn't explain the roller coaster effect. Seamus, Venus does have the sun rise in the west instead in the east. But that doesn't explain this roller coaster effect. This is one of the things that perplexed ancient astronomers for the longest time because nobody realized that we were also on a moving planet. So, part of what you see is Venus's actual movement, and part of what you see is Earth's movement too. We are on a platform that's moving around the sun, and when when Venus is you know passing us on the inside lane, do you see how it looks like almost a perfect straight line? But then when you go to the far side of the line where it gets loopy, you can see that there's a lot of months involved. At that point, Venus is at the far side of its orbit, as far away from us as, as possible, but our planet is moving too. So we're slightly at a different angle depending on where we go. So can you see how hard this would be to calculate with math? You have both of these objects are moving. You're stuck on one of them. You know, it would be like measuring the speed of a fly flying around in a plane, but you're in a different plane also flying. And you're trying to calculate that fly that's going on that other plane that's moving around. So it's complicated and I don't want, I do not expect you to be able to make these calculations, but this is something that you don't need to know the math to get. This is why I think this is cool. Look at the, the top picture is 1956 to 1957. Look at the picture below. Did it, did it do the same thing? No. It's a completely different uh, arrangement. This time Venus went over the sun, right? Instead of under the sun. And that's because sometimes Earth is above or below the plane. So it's actually, here's a good way to think about it. 
Imagine if you were looking at a kid sitting on a rocking horse on one of those merry-go-rounds. And you're also on a rocking horse on a merry-go-round, but you're, you're, some, you're moving at different rates. As you go around the center, you take a picture of your friend. Sometimes your friend will be higher than you. Sometimes your friend will be lower than you. And sometimes your friend will be at the same height as you, depending on where you are in the orbit. And if you can imagine riding a carousel, merry-go-round, on those bobbing horses, that's kind of like what we are. And we're looking towards Venus, which is in the same merry-go-round, but closer towards the center. Okay, so enough of the merry-go-round idea. Let me show you one of the coolest things that you can observe. Let's say you were one of those ancient astronomers from thousands of years ago, and you had a map of the sky. You might have had a circular map, and it was very common for people to make a ring with the creatures of the zodiac. In fact, the word zodiac, we've been referring to it like Gemini, Taurus, and Libra, Scorpio, uh, Leo, Virgo. The word zodiac comes from the Greek words that are the root of zoo, which means animals, like zo, and disc. The word discus, disc, somehow it, it became diac. Zodiac means ring of animals, zoo disc, okay, zodiac. So if you had a table with a zodiac mounted on it, like let's say you had a really nice, you were like, you know, serious astrologer, you had a wooden carved map of the zodiac, and maybe you had little beads that represented the different planets and you plotted them around. What if you drew everywhere you saw Venus? What if you made a plot every time you saw Venus in front of a constellation, you made a little mark and then you connected the dots and you did something like what you see on these diagrams. Well, this is the most exciting thing. If you did this over an eight year period, this is what you would see. I think that's beautiful. It's just stunning actually. Um, and this is actually based from 1961 on. So they, they, someone started in 1961 doing exactly what I was describing. Now, just to make sense of this picture, do you recognize the symbols on the outside of the ring? Yes. Those are the symbols for the Zodiac constellations. Now, I want to be very clear for somebody watching, especially those who may not have watched all the other lessons that I teach. I'm not doing fortune telling here. I, I'm not using where the symbols were 2200 years ago which is what astrologers do this is based on where they are now but you notice um I'll let you know let, I, I don't want to go through all of them but if if you see how the sky is broken up into these different constellations they're not all the same size like if you look at the top left you can see that that that's a very small interval compared to the one that by libra and there's virgo virgo is the big one on the on the left do you see on the left, the one that looks like a letter M with a handle on it? Mm -hmm. That's the symbol for Virgo. See how Virgo is longer than the rest? That's because she's the biggest constellation in the Zodiac. And then the one above her that looks like a tadpole, that's Leo symbol, okay? And then the one that looks like, uh, like a yin yang kind of, that's actually Cancer the crab symbol, okay? I'm not gonna go into all of them, but I just wanted to give you an idea of where we are because actually, uh, well, on my screen, I can't quite see it. Oops, sorry. Sorry, Claudius Ptolemy. I, I have something blocking the place where the Taurus uh, symbol is, but Taurus is obvious. Oh, yeah, it's on the top, near the top. Do you see the Taurus? It looks like a little circle with two horns sticking out of it. Okay, so that if we were doing a plot for Venus, that would be where we would put our plot. And do you see the dotted line around near the center of the circle? That dotted line is the ecliptic line, the zodiac line. Do you remember that Venus right now is above that line in the sky? So if that we were drawing our Venus plot right now, we would put our dot inside of that dotted line circle, closer to the center. Do you see that? So Venus is actually in the middle of doing one of those nice little loop-de-loops that you see. Venus actually just a few uh, couple of weeks ago was at its greatest elongation from the sun. It was at the farthest point it can be from the sun which is like that edge of its orbit. And then as it starts to go back towards the sun, from our point of view, it looks like it does a little loop-de-loop. -loop. And that's what you see. And notice how that those loops happen exactly five times over an eight year period. It's a pretty cool thing um, about the relationship between Venus and the earth. 
Venus will have done five, eight orbits during five years. I mean, I'm sorry, the other way around. I got it backwards. During eight years of, of Earth, we will see Venus go through five of these loops. So that relationship between them in the math is something that people actually calculated a long time ago. The Mayans figured it out thousands of years ago. So people figured out that this happened. And if you made this plot, you see this symbol, the five pointed star. And this goes back to the Mediterranean uh, cultures like the Greeks and the Romans. Do you know the story of Aphrodite and Venus? How she was born from the ocean in a seashell. Maybe you've seen the famous painting. Well, I always thought that the reason why Venus was associated with five pointed stars was because of starfish. Because starfish come from the ocean. They have five points, a lot of them. And, they, and I thought that that was the reason why the starfish was a symbol of Venus. But it turns out that the reason why the five pointed star is one of the ancient symbols of Venus is because of this. So some astrologer, maybe somebody who worked at the Library of Alexandria, who knows, I don't know who the first person was to notice this, but whoever saw this pattern must have seen it as some kind of like a sacred moment, like, oh, Venus is speaking to us. Venus is telling us something. And that is when perhaps, you know, that idea of the five pointed star being associated with the goddess of love happened. It's actually because of that bright light in the sky. So how cool is that? I think you will, you will see that that's a time when all that math and all that dedication and all that observation, imagine if you spend eight years doing that plot for the first couple of years, you'd be like, oh, this just looks like a, a spaghetti noodle got thrown on the page. And then all of a sudden, after eight years, you get that, that picture and you'd be like, Eureka, wow, how cool is that? That wouldn't be an amazing thing to see. So does anybody have any questions about that? Because you can observe this over time. Remember, Venus is really easy to find in the sky. Let me go back to Stellarium for a second here. Um, and I wanna show you what you might be able to expect over the next few days. Oh, hold on. This was April 3rd when that conjunction happened. I hope you guys can see it there. So today's eighth. So if I go forward through time, fourth, fifth, sixth, seventh, eighth, you can see that they're still pretty close together. So I don't know if it's going to stay clear tonight. I think we're supposed to be getting some uh, wintry weather coming in. So you may have to wait a couple nights, but watch what happens on the ninth and the 10th and the 11th and the 12th. And remember Aldebaran, this very bright star in Taurus the bull, that star can be your guide too. If you kind of make a, a triangle in your mind with Pleiades, Aldebaran and Venus, every night that triangle is gonna look radically different. And that's something that I hope you guys try to do over the next you know, couple of days or the next week, because this is something that you can observe. Venus is not the only planet that you can observe moving. Mercury is actually faster than Venus. Remember the messenger guide with his winged sandals. But the problem with Mercury is that Mercury is always close to the sun and you don't have more than maybe 45 minutes to see Mercury in the evening after sunsets or in the morning before the sun rises. Venus gives you hours. So this is a lot easier to track than a planet like Mercury. And I hope you uh, kids do that. Well, I'm going to jump to right now with Stellarium and you'll see that we'll jump to a uh, very bright sunny day i turned off all the labels so that when i run stellarium it looks like the real sky and it doesn't have the names of things already up there but when you guys load it you'll probably see the stars and planets will be labeled already that's something you can turn on or off and maybe as a challenge to yourself maybe you should turn off all the labels and see if you can still identify things that would be a great way for you to train yourselves in how to identify things as close to the real sky as you can get with Stellarium. Seamus, do you have a question? I see your channel's lit up, but I don't hear anything. Or if anybody has a question, please let us know. Otherwise, I'm going to move on to talk about other things in the sky. Oh. It was Let's just a see. nope. <laughs> a nope? Oh, okay. <laughs> I don't have any questions. Well, we're heading up. We're, we're getting close to the midpoint. It's almost four o'clock. So um, I'm going to make you guys do the stretch at some point soon. Maybe we could do that before I get into a whole new constellation. But, but I really, really want you guys to give me some questions. 
I've been going on all this stuff about the Mayans and Venus and five and eight and the five pointed star and the starfish. Uh, and the there's got to be some kind of question. Did you turn well, off? Well, I turned it off. So you shouldn't. Okay. I, I took off Stellarium for the moment. Okay, so that's normal. That's that's okay. But have any of you played with Stellarium at all in the last week? Okay. We can't get it on our computer. Oh no. You could or you could not. Either. We can't. It, our, we need a new computer. Our oh. first, this, we're too, we've got an antique. Ah. <laughs> uh. Oh, I am very sorry about that. I do I do know yeah. that Solarium is pretty intensive. It takes a lot of processing power to run it. You're yeah, like we're a gonna get a new one that we'll get it as soon as we've got our new computer. Oh, uh, I should mention, do you have an iPad by any chance? Because there is an iPad and iPhone version of Stellarium too. Unfortunately, it costs money. Oh, an iPhone, I have an iPhone. I can oh. get it on my iPhone. Yeah, it, it, it costs oh. it, uh, like $1.99. Oh, it's good, not okay. But, but you can you can run and you can do most of the same things that you can on the the desktop. The desktop version just has more features because uh, you have the whole keyboard and you can turn the things on and off. But the one that you get on your phone can help you a lot too. Um, Good. It, it would look similar to the one that you get on your computer. So try that out. All right. Okay. Thanks. And it looks like we have a few questions, um, such as when will we be able to see Mercury, and then what painting of Aphrodite were you talking about? You might be able to look up. Oh, uh, yes, uh, it's a famous. I, uh, is I, I'm forgetting his name right now, uh, but I'm looking it up for you because it is a beautiful painting of Aphrodite sitting inside of a big shell, um, and um, I'm a little embarrassed to tell you the story of how Aphrodite was born. But she wasn't born from uh, like you know a normal way. <laughs> she 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 was sprung from the blood of Kronos. Remember when Kronos uh, was defeated by his son Luke Skywalker? No, sorry, Zeus. Oh. Uh, <laughs> it's called when the that of battle it. happened. A it's lot of blood of was spilled. And uh, the blood of Kronos that landed in the ocean eventually transformed itself into the goddess of love, strangely enough. Um, and when I think of that scene of her emerging from the ocean, the painting that, that I think of, oh, it's Sandro Botticelli. How could I forget that name? So I'm gonna pull up the famous painting. Uh, let's see if uh, <laughs> you can buy a $100 silk version of it easily, uh, hold on. Let me just load it up in case you've never seen it. I bet you have seen it. The Botticelli Birth of Venus is definitely his most famous painting. And I'm just trying to find uh, a nice version of it that's not for sale. Oh, <laughs> give me a second and I'll share it with you guys. So this one's just almost censored enough for family viewing. But this is the Botticelli's Venus. Now you see her standing in the seashell. Um, but well, I'll let you find out what that seashell is a symbol for. Is a sort of substitute, a euphemism for something a little grosser from the story. But it's a piece of Kronos that became Venus. So look at it that way. <laughs> um, so there you go. You guys getting culture all over the place. So you learn about Renaissance paintings, you learn about ancient civilizations. This is why astronomy is so wonderful. You never run out of things to connect it to. Um, so anybody have a question? Ear. Oh, Matthew, nice guess. Ear. If it was just Cronus's ear, I wouldn't be so squeamish about talking about it. So, <laughs> so let's just say that a lot of the versions of mythology that you kids may have seen, like Disney's Hercules, have been made G-rated for <laughs> family audiences. But in reality, a lot of Greek mythology, like almost all the mythology that I've ever run into, uh, it's more like TVMA, okay? It's more like uh, you're gonna see people get hurt in bloody ways and you're gonna hear all kinds of horrible acts happening. That is the real mythology. You know, it wasn't made G-rated. It was, uh, you know, R-rated, at least back in ancient times. And today, a lot of the stories that we know are cleaned up for family consumption. So that's what I had to do with that one. So 
<laughs> um, anybody have any questions? Okay, we are about four o'clock. So let me give you a chance. I'm going to give you guys a three or four minute break. Everybody stretch. If you need to use the restroom, this is a good time for that. But if you have a trampoline like I do outside, maybe you want to jump on that. <laughs> so you guys in just a moment. Do Go run or do something, jumping jacks, run up the stairs. Do some stretches, do some Here. yoga. <laughs> doing jumping jacks. Stretch, move. Um, oh. Go to the bathroom. You have to go to the bathroom. Yeah. That's a good stretch. Mm -hmm. Stretch leave. Do some stretches. No, but I need Yeah, but we did that and it cracked. Okay, do that. This one. This one. This one. Some more work is what week weekend or week weekend weekend is two words or I'm sorry, one word so it's a trampolining is a great way to boost your heart rate and get your body warm again Whew. ah that was fun <laughs> can't have the vomit comment so uh, that's the best I can do pretend I'm in space for a, a couple seconds at a time. <laughs> as I fall through the air. Wow, is everybody back? I see. Yeah. I, hear, I see. Matthew, Lily, are you back? I don't know. I just want to. I want to get started, but I don't want to make anybody miss out. But we have had enough time for a couple minute break. So. You guys remember the whole story I talked about uh, Virgo last time. I know I spent a good amount of time on the lady, the goddess of flowers. So we talked about Bootes, the ice cream cone. Is there anything <laughs> else? Anything else that you guys like? This is a good chance for you to ask me if you don't remember how to see some of the constellations that we talked about last time. 
gonna go back to Stellarium, make it today, right now, and let's see what else is out there. I spent a lot of time talking about Venus. I'm not planning on talking anymore about Taurus or Orion or any of the stuff in the South that we called, you know, the Mariner Circle, the Winter Circle, Sailor Circle, all those different names. So there's Venus. There's the sunset. I hope you can all see that. Does everybody recognize who else is almost as bright as Venus over here? Sirius. Oh, no, the belt of Orion points towards. Yes, yeah, Sirius, Shaman, you got it. Sirius, the dog star. And there's Procyon, the little dog star. There are the jet wind heads. I've got the big view out, you know, so you can kind of see how that sailor circle is still visible at this time of year, even though winter's over. But let's do it. let's look over at the other side of the sky a little bit more. Venus is in the west, but we've got that moon in the east. And remember, the moon's not going to be there. Last night it was here. And two nights from now, it won't even have risen at this same time. So remember, that moon is always on the move. It's not something you want to use to help you find constellations because that's going to change from night to night. But if you're looking east in the direction of the moon, you might remember that very bright star. Oops, I'm trying to highlight it here. Arcturus. Does anybody remember that trick I showed you for how to find Arcturus in case you're not sure which star it is? Virgo's hand. Oh no, that was, that was Spica. Ah, okay. So hold on a second. Actually having a hard time because the glare out here, for some reason, is harder to see than it was before. Um, but all right, let's look at the big picture. We're zoomed way out. I see here the heart of the lion, Regulus. I see down here uh, the tail of the lion, Denebola. And over here is Arcturus. And oh, sorry, guys. Is it down here? There's Spica. That's the bright blue star that was Virgo's flowers in her hand. But Arcturus is the one that belongs to Bootis, the ox herder. So, but they are very bright stars and they're all close to each other. But Arcturus has that little silly mnemonic device. Look it up here. Does anybody recognize what I'm tracing out? This is the Dipper. Big Dipper. And it has a handle that arcs to Arcturus. Remember Arc to Arcturus? It's a silly thing. And some folks add another line, which is after you've Arc to Arcturus, you spike it to Spica. So think of a volleyball being spiked in a straight line down from there. After you follow the arc, the arc curves and then a straight line. You've got Arcturus, a yellowish star, and Spica, a bluish star. So when it gets cloudy or if the full moon is out, that might be all that you get. That moon is so bright that you might not get to see the whole constellation. So that's why I, I recommend that you also familiarize yourself with individual stars like Arcturus and Spica, because then you will know which constellations you're looking at even if you can't see the majority of its stars. And I remember that's, that the, this is the illustration that they have for Virgo. Remember, she's the goddess of flowers and she's only visible in the sky during the spring and summer months, right? Well. Well, actually, I was thinking of telling you guys a different type of story with the same stars. But instead of the stories from the ancient Greeks and Romans, you know, I was going to tell you a story that comes from a civilization that's from the southwestern part of the United States, the Tiwa people. These are a, a group of, of folks that are also known as the San Ildefonso Indians. And they're one of the groups that are called Pueblo Indians in history. And if you go on eBay right now, you'll see that they have amazingly beautiful pottery and turquoise and silver jewelry that they traditionally make. That's something that in today's world is a serious form of income and economy for people of the Tiwa Nation. So this is a group of people that you can go visit in San Ildefonso in New Mexico. They live close to the Rio Grande, close to the border. Um, and you know, they, and their, their civilization has been there. In fact, do you remember that supernova we talked about before? 
And that happened in a similar region to, of, in New Mexico, close to where these folks live. But this is a story about somebody in the sky that you've been hearing me call Orion. So I just want to show you a different way that a culture can use the sky to memorialize things, not just characters from mythology, because according to the Tiwa people, this character that we can see in Orion is actually not a fictional mythological creature or character, but a real human being, a person who lived presumably thousands of years ago. And the, the story is, a, is a, a remembrance of a moment in their history when this person used an invention to save the entire Tiwa nation. So if you remember Orion, the picture of Orion that I remember, I hope you remember his shoulders, his head, his belt, his sword and his legs. Now, remember that it looks like he's using a bow and arrow with his arm, his right arm behind his head and his left arm showing a bow held in his hand. Well, in the Tiwa stories, they see pretty much the exact same picture as what the ancient Greeks saw as Orion the hunter. But their story calls him Long Sash. So instead of this being a sword, imagine it being sort of like a, a, a sash blowing in the wind, like a kilt or an apron or a skirt on this brave warrior. Now, the story involves a lot of the same stars and constellations that we've been talking about. So just as a, a reminder, we're going to be talking about Gemini and Cancer and Leo, but we're not going to be talking about them as Gemini, Cancer, and Leo. We're going to be seeing them in the way that the Tiwa people have seen them for a long time. So let me just give you the, the quick version of the story. The, the Tiwa people are farmers by tradition. The people that live in the pueblos of New Mexico in ancient times had figured out how to irrigate the desert and bring water from far away to their crops. And they grew typically corn, beans, and squash, and the world's best hot peppers. Anyway, that's another story. But that's where all that culture comes from. And the Tiwa people used to farm, and they used to harvest their crops at the same time every year. But then they noticed that one of their neighboring nations, and I don't know which culture this is in the story, but a culture that wasn't farmers, but was more like nomadic, would come to their farms and raid their farms and steal all of their crops every harvest. And, it was an Avajos. Oh, you know this story, or are you guessing? No, we're from there, so. Oh my gosh. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. The Navajos are like the raiders. Yeah, they're the ones who come in and. Well, I, I just want to be clear. I don't want to impugn any culture of today's world. No, no, that's good. <laughs> we're, that's good. Like, if you know, yeah, it's just the Navajos. So wait, I shouldn't be telling the story if you guys know this story so well. No, no, we don't know. We want to hear. We oh. want to hear about San Ildefonso. <laughs> oh, this is so cool. I... <laughs> yeah. So you guys are from that town or from that, you know, that region? Or? No, from south, just south of there, a different Pueblo. Uh, Cochiti. Oh, it's like south, but along the Rio Grande, if you just follow the Rio Grande south from there, like just not very far. Oh, well, I hope I'm lucky enough to get a tour from you someday. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> <laughs> we lived right on the Rio Grande. Oh, wow. So this, this is actually a story that takes place right where you used to live. Um, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I'll, um, so I'm even happier to tell you this story. Okay. Well, so no, anyway, happy to hear. <laughs> in the story, the, the Tiwa people were getting sick and tired of being raided all the time and getting all their food stolen. So they decided that it was time to basically pick up all their stuff and leave and move to another place where they hoped this wouldn't happen, which meant that a culture that was used to being farmers had to suddenly turn into long distance travelers. Uh, and that's a tough thing for a farmer because you can't grow corn in a backpack, right? So all of a sudden, all the ways that you're used to living uh, go uh, disappear and if you know New Mexico lots of regions of New Mexico are very dry very big deserts um, and according to the story these people started wandering into a desert and for months they were wandering they couldn't find a good place to live they started running out of food they started running out of water and eventually there started to be a fight amongst the people of the village the the village on the road 
half of the people said, we want to go back. We don't care if they rate our crops. I'd rather get my crops raided than starve to death out here in this desert and have the vultures eat me. And the other half of the group said, no, we can't go back. I don't want those raiders to take all our food. We're going to starve to death if we go back home because we'll have nothing to, there to eat. Anyway, I'd rather go forward and hopefully find a new land. And this is actually what the Tiwa people see as the two stars that we call the heads of the Gemini twins. According to the Tiwa story, these are the two camps. The place of division is what they call this. One camp wanted to go. One camp wanted to go back. So call those Castor and Pollux. But in the Tiwa culture, these are two groups of villagers arguing with each other about which direction to go. And that's kind of cool because they're like twin stars, implying like the camp were evenly divided. They were equal, almost equal numbers of people on both sides. So while this fight is going on, a young man named Longsash, who's the main character in this story, decides that he wants to meditate on this. He wants to pray. He wants to figure out what to do, how to help his people. And so he walks away from the place of division and he goes into a part of the sky that I told you last week was not very distinctive. Well, remember Cancer the Crab right here? Mm-hmm. Yep. Well, imagine rearranging those stars so that instead of seeing it like that as a crab, Imagine looking like one of those big, wide hats, like a Mexican sombrero, the kind of hat you'd want to wear if you had to spend a long time walking through the desert. That is the hat of Longsash, the constellation we call Cancer. According to the story, Longsash walked away from the place of division, which is where Gemini is, and walked to that spot to meditate. And when he sat down, he took off his hat. And when he took off his hat, he began to pray to the Great Spirit to help him solve this problem. And as he was praying, he saw an eagle dive behind a hill and it dove behind the hill out of his sight. And then a few moments later, he saw the same eagle pop up from behind the hill and it had a fish in its talons. So for Longsash, that was the symbol that he was waiting for. He saw that fish and he knew that 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 eagle had to have caught that fish from a body of water. There must be some water over that hill. And he ran up the hill and looked and he found the Rio Grande, which is where the Tiwa people live today. So he was so excited that he saw this that he forgot to pick up his hat. And that's why his hat is still sitting there in the sky. He ran back to the place of division, uh, which we call the Gemini twins. And he told the people, we don't need to fight. There is no need to discuss. We have found a new home. We are almost there. And he led the people over to that place. But the people still were hungry. And some of the people were so hungry and so sick that they could not walk anymore. They said, Long Sash, how are we going to get there? Well, now this is where I turn to the constellation that we call Leo the Lion. If you look at Leo... Now, let's look at him without the picture. Remember how his head looks like a hook and his body is kind of like a big flat rectangle. Well, has anybody ever heard of a thing that in American culture, we usually call a travois from the French word? It's, a, it's like a, a litter. If you've ever watched a cowboy movie, you've seen it whenever somebody gets hurt. They don't, they don't carry the person, but they make a sled that gets dragged behind a horse and that sled runs across the ground and the person lays on top of it. Have you ever, ever seen that in a Western movie? Because I had, that's where I grew up learning about that. Well, in the story, that's what Leo is. It's a, it's a sled made to carry the injured and the sick. Those who could not make it to the new valley were carried on this giant, you could say travois, that's, the, that's what we call them. But uh, it's like a sled for, or maybe a gurney, uh, you know, the kind of thing that we use in modern times. Well, when a stretcher, when the paramedics come to get somebody, they have that stretcher that they carry them out in. Think of that as an ancient stretcher. And the hook part of Leo's head is the part that a person would have put on as like backpack straps. So imagine that you're standing there, you put the hook over your shoulders, and then you carry your uh, elderly uh, relatives who can't walk anymore because they're too dehydrated and too hungry. And another part of the story is that Longstash did a new technology. 
so he could help his people find food until they got to their farm, until they were able to grow the food that they needed. They needed to hunt. So according to the Tiwa story, in this journey, Long Sash not only found their home on the Rio Grande, but also invented the bow and arrow to help feed his people. And in the Tiwa tradition, this is not considered a fictional myth. This is considered to be a true history of their culture. And actually, there's nothing about this story that sounds like it's too far-fetched to be true. Uh, I, I don't have any trouble believing that this is a, a, at heart a true story, and it probably happened thousands of years ago. So it's kind of cool to think of how a, a story can stay alive in a culture for so long, and it was never written down in an alphabet language until modern times, but it was remembered because people saw it in the stars. So we talk about mythology in the stars, but there's also history in the stars, like the drinking gourd in which a, a constellation or an asterism takes on a meaning of its own that isn't just important for telling a fictional story, but actually a part of the life for real factual people uh, and something that actually plays a, a role in history. So I, I love that story of Tiwa, the Tiwa story of Long Sash, the place of division, his hat, and the travois that he carried the sick with because it actually covers a huge part of the sky. So did you have any, anybody have any questions about any of this? It looks I like hope you could. Seamus was asking if there a constellation or something that represents the Rio Grande in this story. Oh, you know, there might be, and it might just be that I, it has escaped my memory. It's been a long time since I studied this, but I, it makes me want to go back and look. Uh, one of the sources of this story that I used is a book that I uh, have in my office. It's called the, the Stars of the First People, and it was written by Dorka Miller. And it's like an encyclopedia. It's one of the best references that I have. But it, um, Dorca S. Miller uh, went around and interviewed all the elders of different Native American cultures and tried to collect as many of the stories as possible from different cultures. And that is also the same source of the story that I know about the Big Dipper that I was about to tell you guys now. So, um, but as far as something representing the Rio Grande, you know, I'm tempted to say something like the Milky Way. But the Milky Way isn't very bright at this time of the year. But if you look carefully, the Milky Way does kind of run in the same direction as Orion. So you could say that in a way, it looks like he's standing in a river of stars. Perhaps that's also part of the story too, but I'm just guessing. Hold on a second, guys. I hate to uh, leave you, but I'm actually, if you might have noticed, my hair is moving a lot. There's a lot more wind and the sun has gone away. So I'm actually freezing right now. So I'm going to run and grab a coat real quick. But maybe in this two seconds that I can go grab a coat, some of you come, come up with a really good question or a suggestion of something else that you'd like to see. He lives in a straw barrel house. That's better. <laughs> I have a question, Bobby. Yes, please. Are you warm? <laughs> I'm I'm a lot more comfortable now than I was a moment ago. This is the okay. right time of year for this weather. Good. But no, that, that's that's not the question. I uh, which I hope you have a question about the sky, not there about my comfort. Oh, <laughs> there is one. Um, Seamus was asking if there are any meteor showers uh, coming up. I got to look at this up. I wasn't planning on this, so I, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say that I can't off the top of my head remember. But I think this is the time when we have the Taurids and the Leonids. I'll give you five bucks if you can guess which constellations they're associated with. Taurids and the, the ball. Leonid. Taurus and Leo. <laughs> yeah, maybe I should have said 20, uh, five bucks because now I'm going to be broke. Um, <laughs> but, um, can I actually, have ice cream? Ice cream? Oh, is that, is that what you'll take instead of $5? Yes. Uh, look at it this way, guys. I don't know when we're all gonna be able to hang out together again, but I'll make this promise. Next time we reunite, I will get ice cream for all of you. How about that? Yeah. <laughs> I, I, 
I, I, will, I will buy a bunch of flavors. I don't know. We'll, we'll, we'll make a plan when it comes time because this might be months away from now. But I promise I'll get you guys ice cream someday. <laughs> That'll be the, the, the price of all this inconvenience. So, um, oh, well, actually, there is a meteor shower that is supposed to happen later on this month. It's called the Lyrids. And also, we have the Eta Aquarids. So who can guess where the Lyrids come from? That's actually a constellation that I could talk about today because that's sort of the springtime and summer constellations that are coming soon. But Lyra, has anybody heard of that constellation? Anybody read the Golden Compass? Lyra Belacqua, anyway, the His Dark Materials series. That's where she got her name. Lyra is the constellation where the Lyrids are going to come from. And then the Ada Aquarids are associated with the water boy, Aquarius. So one place that I can send you, and I'm gonna I'm gonna put the link on the chat so that you guys can check it out too. The American Meteor Meteor Society has a website that not only is it telling you when the next meteor showers are, but this is actually the website that you should go to if you ever spot a really bright meteor and you want to make a report. Um, this website has a cool map function that if you make a report at the time that you do, it shows you all of the other people who are reporting the same meteor. And the more people who report it, the faster they can calculate which direction the meteor came from and where it's going. And if it, if it actually landed on the ground, where it could be found. Um, so there are meteor showers coming up. They're always happening, but a meteor can happen at any time, regardless of whether or not there's a meteor shower. And I'll just tell you how cool they can be. Because one time, there was a meteor that happened around 10.30 in the middle of the night. I, I, everybody else in my house was asleep. I was still up. I was doing some dishes. It was dark. It was February. So it was winter. And all of a sudden, while I'm sitting at the sink, I out the windows, everything outside became as bright as day for just a couple of seconds. And I was, you know freaked out it was like a, it was like a long, long lightning flash had gone off except that uh you know there was winter there was no lightning at that time of year so i actually freaked out and i ran outside and i looked and i couldn't see anything in the sky by the time i got outside it was all over but what happened was a meteor came into the sky and exploded so bright that people saw it everywhere i thought it was over vermont in fact it, feel, it felt like it was right over my house but I saw reports from Ottawa, Canada, and from Brooklyn, New York. All of them were at the same time as the one that I saw. So everybody always thinks that the meteor is right over their head. But when these meteors explode, when you see that bright flash of light, it's actually happening around 70,000 feet above your head. So imagine how high that is. That's twice as high as where airplanes fly. Now, just think about this. If you've ever been in an airplane, how much of the land can you see? You can see a lot of states at the same time. Now imagine if you were twice as high, how much of the, of the land could you see? And then imagine if you were glowing bright like a meteor, all those people could see you and all of them would say, it's right over my house. But actually you might be seeing something that's happening hundreds of miles away from you. It just looks like it's right over your house because like that full moon zoom effect, when something bright appears in the dark sky, your brain does not have a way of measuring the size, but the brightness makes you think it's huge. And that, and if something is huge, it must be close to you, right? So all of these are sort of like a perceptual assumptions that our brains make. And a meteor shower is a great way to see that. So I'm trying to find a, a picture of that because after months of searching, I was able to find a photograph that somebody took of that same meteor that I saw but it was uh, by a webcam that was just by luck turned on. Oh, here it is, I found it. So hold on a second. After months of searching, I found that somebody had photographed it and here it is. That's the one that I saw. Look at the time on the 10, 12 PM. So that is the same night, February 28th, 2012. It's a long time ago now, I guess. And see that big flash right there in the middle? See how the streak is bright and then it gets extra bright in that center? That's an explosion. And that is the explosion that made my backyard look like it was daytime. 
But if you look at where this picture was taken, it was taken at the Kittery Portsmouth uh, drawbridge, which is on the border between Maine and New Hampshire on the coast. So that's a couple hundred miles away from here. And they saw it there and, you know, uh, that, that I thought it was over my house and that's hundreds of miles away. So that is something that you can see when a meteor does that particular thing, it's called a bolide. That's just the technical term for a very big, bright flashing meteor. And you don't have to wait for a meteor shower for one of those to happen. They're always happening constantly. So you could go out any night and see that. But imagine if this happens on cloudy weather then you don't see the meteor, but you see the brightness. And that's even more freaky when you don't know where the light is coming from. I'm gonna give you a, one more example of this, but it looks like somebody flashed up a question here. Ah, where did it explode over? Well, everything that I've read made it seem like that thing hit the ocean. If there was anything left uh, you know, uh, by the time it hit the ground, it would have probably splashed into the Atlantic far off the coast of New England. But even if it were to land on the ground, there wouldn't really be much there because most of the times when a meteor comes into the Earth's atmosphere, it hits the atmosphere so fast that the friction with the air, and this is something I always do. Imagine if you were at home, maybe you're like me sitting out in the cold, rub your hands together really fast and you notice that the friction causes your hands to get hot really quick, especially if you press really hard or go really fast. And imagine if your hands were going 70,000 miles an hour past each other, which is how fast that meteor was traveling when it hit the atmosphere. That rug burn causes the meteor to turn into a fireball and it gets completely evaporated. It turns into smoke, dust, and ash. And by the time it gets to the ground, it might just be microscopic or tiny particles of ash. Maybe if it was really big to begin with, or if it was made out of mostly metals, like the iron meteorites that we have, then it might make it to the ground in a big you know, chunk. Uh, but that doesn't happen most of the time. Almost every meteor that you see will evaporate or turn to ash before it hits the ground. So you're not going to get hit on the head. Can it still be? But uh, that is there. Bobby, could it, can it still be um, uh, a light? I, I'm remembering back when I was in high school, we were all hanging out at night by a, a, a pond and this big uh -huh. bright light came out of the sky and, and splashed right into the water in front of us. Whoa, um, you saw a splash? It, it, it fell right in and, it, and it, it, it was still lit until it hit the water. That, that that's probably rarer than winning the lottery <laughs> i'm not kidding uh to to see that with your own eyes when it hits the ground that i mean you are only the second person that i've ever heard of that saw a meteor probably close enough to when it landed that it was still hot or detectably hot just to give you a quick story i met I, we used to, we have something in our collection that we're holding until we get it identified but there's a guy who grew up in massachusetts and he went out to hay a field and he saw a rock that had set some of the hay on fire wow. on the field. So he got there hours after the fact, but the hay was smoky and smoldering and this rock was sitting right on top of it. And he was like, there's no volcanoes in Massachusetts right now. So <laughs> <laughs> there's, got, there's, gotta be, there's gotta be a rock that came from space so hot that it burned the hay when it landed. So what you saw, yes, those rocks are, that hot when they're flying through the air. So if it did hit the water, it would probably be red and steam. Um, it all well, happens very fast. <laughs> let me show you. You know what? Is that Christy that said this? Um, yes. You you could have been the next Ann Hodges. I don't know if you uh, <laughs> have ever heard of Ann Hodges. Uh, she's the only person in history to have ever been struck by a meteor that we can prove, and she did not die. Wow. <laughs> um, and so and let me actually share this with you guys, because um, uh, this is not where I was expecting to go, but this is why I'm so happy to get your questions, because these are the stories that I love to uh, tell you folks to give you the wonder to keep looking up. But uh, maybe this is the wrong kind of story because it might freak you out. But because um, Sadie lady, Ann Hodges, well, while she was she was a person who worked a late shift, she worked at night. So she was sleeping during the day on her couch in uh Oak Grove, Mississippi. And while she was sleeping during the day, 
she heard this giant boom on the roof of her house. And then a couple seconds later, the attic roof spilled. I mean, the, you know, the ceiling of her attic, it ripped open and this red hot rock fell out. It landed on that radio that's right behind her in the picture. It bounced off of that onto the coffee table that was right next to her. And then it landed on top of the blanket that was covering her while she was sleeping on her couch. So because it hit all those other objects and she had a blanket on top of her, her injuries were pretty mild. But look at the picture on the right, you can see the third degree burn that she got there. It burned her skin pretty bad. But that was pretty lucky compared to what could have happened. Like, imagine if she had not had that house protecting her and if it hit her directly, she almost certainly would have been killed. But look at how hot that rock was that it touched her skin and caused that to happen. So, Christy, what you saw could have been the same thing. Had that rock moved a few feet over, it could have hit you or your friends, and then you'd be as famous as Ann Hodges. <laughs> Maybe you don't want her fate. She, just as a, to add to this, she, she suffered a terrible fate for the fact that she became famous overnight. She got photographed and she was on the cover of Life magazine. And like a lot of uh, stories where somebody becomes rich overnight, within a few years, she had spent all of the money she made and she was poor and, and she, she died uh, young, you know, young in her life because of the poverty and the neglect to herself that came from like getting rich all of a sudden and then, not, and then losing it all of a sudden. It's this kind of thing that happens to people who win the lottery sometimes. So in a way, she won a cosmic lottery, but it didn't work out so great for her in the end. And actually, since we're talking about this, <laughs> only a few years ago, this, was hap this happened in Paraguay, I believe, that a meteor went right through somebody's ceiling and hit their television <laughs> and broke the glass on the screen. And look at the rock. You can see that it's only about three or four inches in height. Right, that is a meteorite that came close to hurting a person, but just broke a television and the roof of their house instead. So this kind of thing happens. But let me, uh, let's see if anybody yeah, remembers have, this. Do you have, yeah, this one, because Sadie's asking, is there a sound or impact that ah. we can hear or see that might affect us? <laughs> can you guys see that bright light that's brighter than the sun? That's a bolide. And do you see that bright flash, that explosion? That happened in Chelyabinsk, Russia, uh, eight years ago. And when that explosion happened, it had the same energy as 45 Hiroshima-style atomic bombs. Okay? So imagine what would have happened if that explosion happened when the rock was on the ground. It would have made a crater a mile wide. It would have wiped a, ma a city off of the map. But luckily, it actually exploded at you know, 70,000 or so feet up. So the explosion didn't have any enough, enough of a shockwave to hurt people directly. But the thing from that explosion that did uh, affect people was the sound. But that, that meteor coming in was estimated to be about the size of a UPS truck, you know, just to give you a figure of something that you could, uh, you know, think of in your mind. But by the time it got to the ground, most of the pieces were smaller than a golf ball. And only one piece this big was found. This is the, the largest chunk of that meteorite that made it to the ground. Um, it's about, you know, the size of a pizza box. Not very big. But just think about it. So think about something the size of a UPS truck being ground down and, and rubbed down and it disintegrated to the point where the biggest chunk that's left is the size of a pizza box. From UPS truck to pizza box. Kind of gives you an idea of how much the atmosphere chews up these meteorites on their way down. Um, but to answer Sadie's question, all right, I'm gonna show you a little clip. I hope that the sound can come out with uh, the, the picture. Hold on a second. I think you guys can see that video there and I'm gonna another one real quick. Uh, okay, so <laughs> I hope you guys can hear this. But let me give you a context before we go on. Have you ever been to a 4th of July fireworks show? Have you ever noticed how sound travels a lot slower than light? So when the fireworks go off, you see the explosion. And then a couple seconds later, you hear the boom. Okay. And think about the fact that, you know, you're probably a mile or less away from the fireworks that you're watching. But sound travels around, you know, less than 700 miles an hour, whereas light travels 671 million miles an hour. So it's literally a million times faster than sound, light. 
So the, 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 the light's going to get to you faster than the sound. But now imagine that instead of the fireworks being a mile away from you, there are dozens of miles away from you. The light is still going to get to you almost instantly, but the sound might take minutes to reach you. And that's what happened to the folks in Russia. So forgive me, I, you may want to turn up your speakers or turn them down if you're <laughs> depending on how loud this is. But here's a phone video from somebody in Russia who stepped outside because they saw the light of the explosion and they saw the smoke. Look at that meteor. Look at the smoke. That's actually the meteor the itself rubbed to pieces. But then minutes later, I think it's hilarious how all the car alarms on the whole neighborhood went off at the same time. But you, I, I, if you're not, I, luckily Vermont kids are not familiar with car alarms. We don't use them as much as you do in big cities, but a car alarm to make it go off, you usually have to hit a car or shake it really bad. So that gives you an idea of how much of an impact this was that it actually made cars shake. And that person was lucky because they were standing far away from a building. Let me show you the, my favorite version of this is a person doing the exact same thing as the last video, but this person had the misfortune of standing next to a building with glass windows. Now, I don't speak Russian, but I noticed that both of those people said the same thing <laughs> after that happened. And I found out from some of our other members of this class in the past who are Russian that it's not something I can repeat in English. So <laughs> I know now I know how to curse in Russian if I if I ever see a meteor explode over my head. So, um, however, that's pretty scary, isn't it? Uh, that 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 sent thousands of people to the hospital. It didn't just break glass windows. It actually caused garage doors, steel garage doors to break and flap in the wind like leaves. And that's because it exploded 70,000 feet up. So you don't need me to tell you how bad that could be if it happened right on the ground. That's how craters happen. So think of that as a very lucky way to experience a meteor because um, it could have been a lot worse. And then if you think about it, it was the size of a UPS truck. The thing that killed the dinosaurs was the size of a town, six miles wide. So that's another order of magnitude. That's where you're not worrying about popping your eardrums. You're worrying about preserving the life on earth. So hope not, I don't want to scare you guys <laughs> with any of this. Because whenever people hear about this, their qu next question is, is there another one heading this way? Well, the probable answer is yes. At some point, a big rock will probably come close to the earth um, and it could happen again. But there's so many ways that we could try to prevent this. First of all, we would know about it ahead of time, possibly years in advance. And that is to me the most uh, you know, encouraging thing because if you know something is coming, then you can do something about it. And we've actually been able to engineer spaceships that can land on asteroids and comets. We've done it many times. The European Space Agency did it first with Rosetta and Philae. And right now, NASA is engaged in a mission called OSIRIS-REx. That is actually, um, I can actually show you, I think uh, a picture here. Uh, OSIRIS-REx is a cool name. Sounds like a dinosaur and an Egyptian god at the same time. Um, but this, this mission, and I have the picture here, Osiris is the Egyptian god of the dead. Uh, you remember we talked about Isis a little bit. This was her husband. And this uh, bird on the right is a character from Egyptian mythology called Bennu. Bennu is like an ibis, but he's not just an ordinary bird. He's sort of like a sacred heavenly bird. And you notice he's wearing that fancy hat that Osiris is wearing. Now, Bennu is the name of the asteroid. 
and do you see that asteroid rotating in the picture? That thing is a little less than a mile wide. Ouch, if it hits a planet, obviously. That imagine that's like a sixth of what killed the dinosaurs. So, you know, maybe only one continent of life would be lost instead of all the world, you know, having a mass extinction. But obviously, we don't want something like that to crash here. But that robotic spacecraft called the Cyrus Rex has actually been able to navigate right up to that. And you see that probe sticking out of it that looks like a, a tube coming down? It's like a vacuum cleaner, essentially. And Osiris Rex was able to get close enough to Bennu, the asteroid, that it was able to suck up some of the particles on the surface. And then it's going to put them into a capsule, like a little uh, you know, tiffin, a little tin can. And it's going to ship that back to Earth. So one of the coolest things about this mission is that we're going to end up with some actual samples of a rock that has not ever touched a planet until we get it. And it's kind of like the raw materials that all the planets are made out of. This is the stuff that was present in the solar system before Earth and before Earth's life existed. So just think, what's going to be inside that rock? Hold on a second. Let's see. Do you guys see me now? All right. I was, I saw, I thought my signal was getting a little choppy, but just think this is one of the cool things about uh, this mission. When we get this rock sample, what if we find things inside of it like protein or amino acids? That will have never been a part of a planet in the solar system. It could imply that the possibility of finding life out there will increase um, just from this one little rock. So a lot of scientists are really excited to get that sample because it could tell us that life might have be older than the earth itself. Imagine what kind of discovery that would be. And also something else in the news that you may want to be paying attention to because this year uh, we're launching a robot to Mars. It was called Mars 2020, but just a few weeks ago, there was a kid who uh, got the honor of give, picking its name. Did any of you hear about this? No, Leela doesn't even know. I'm shocked. Um, well, here's the, I'm going to show you the picture of the kid. Actually, uh, well, I can actually pull up a video real quick. Uh, hold on a second. I don't know if you guys watch television, but uh, I do a monthly thing at Channel 3 where I usually go in live and I talk about what's happening in astronomy in the news. But because of this whole situation where we're all socially distant now, instead of doing that, I had to prepare a video ahead of time. So they, they let this weirdo into the Fairbanks Museum right there. <laughs> hey there, CAA This is Bobby Farley's Rubio at the Fairbanks Museum and Planetarium. Talk about what's been going on in the sky over the last month. All right, enough of that guy. So um, I talked about what we guys just talked about. So you actually don't need to watch it, but check this out. I was hoping it was going to be one of you guys that won this honor, but this kid named Alexander Mather from Burke, not Vermont, but Burke, Virginia, he wrote the award-winning essay that got his name chosen for the Mars 2020 robot. Nobody knows the name? Nobody heard this yet? Well, the last one in 2012, it was named by a girl who was a sixth grader. Her name was Claire Ma, and she picked the name Curiosity. And because of her award-winning essay, she got to watch the launch of Curiosity back in 2012. Well, now it's Alexander Mather's turn and he picked the name Perseverance. And here's a cool video of them actually engraving the name on the Alexander robot. Congratulations Alexander Mather from Burke, Virginia, whose name Perseverance. Wait, I'm gonna see, can you see it? Look at the laser engraving system that NASA has. I want that. And that's the robot that he got to name. So how cool is that? That kid, got to pick the name of a robot that's going to be on Mars forever. And even when that robot stops working, what if one day humans have colonies on Mars? This will probably be part of some kind of Mars National Park. And right in the middle of it will be a robot named by a kid that grew up in Virginia who's now, I think, 12 years old. So how cool is that? And maybe one day you guys will get to name a Mars rover. <laughs> Per perseverance what a good name right that's what we need right now perseverance in this time that we're in so okay any other questions we only have about 12 minutes left so 
I'm hoping you guys have some good questions for me. Did, did we answer last week's question about why stars come up four minutes ah. early? Oh, thank you so much. I almost forgot that that was the lingering question from last week. Did anybody figure that out? Even a guess. I don't care if you get it right or wrong. The daylight increases and decreases? Now, remember that as our daylight increases in the spring, it's decreasing for folks that live in Australia because they're in the fall right now. Right. So that's more of a local effect based on what part of the curved earth that you're on. Right. And so that doesn't explain the four minute difference, which actually is the same for an Australian as it would be for us. So it actually has a lot to do with the answer to why Venus looked like it was doing that roller coaster track in its orbit around the sun. The thing about the stars and the sky that most people forget when they're starting this process of learning astronomy is that we live on a moving platform too. So our observations are not objective. Like you want to be in science. You want to be objective. You want to be neutral. But because we live on a moving planet, we're not neutral. We have a bias based on the fact that our platform is shifting where it is every single day. So I'm not, I'm going to still wait. I'm hoping to hear somebody can get, make a guess as to the right answer as to why a star rises four minutes earlier every day. Well, if you were an astronomer, you would say that this is the difference between solar time, which is what most people know. Everybody thinks about time from a solar perspective. But if you're an astronomer, you also think about sidereal time. And that, when I was a college freshman, I thought it was sidereal. It looks like S-I-D-R-E-A-L. And I thought sidereal, like to the side of what's real. That's what it looks like. But that's because there's an ancient Latin word, siderius, which means star. So sidereal comes from the old Latin word for star. So basically sidereal just means star time. Star time versus solar time. I'll give you a perfect example. What if I calculated my clock based on when the sun is in the middle of the sky? I use a sundial. So when the shadow of the sun is pointing north, I know the sun is in the south. And I say, this is my noon. So I create noon based on the solar position, right? But what if there was somebody else who wanted to make a clock, but they weren't like me, they were nocturnal. So they wanted to make it work at night. And let's say instead of using the sun and the shadow of the sun, they use the star like Sirius, the brightest star in the sky. Let's say your clock or your star dial in this case was based on Sirius crossing the middle of the sky. It wouldn't make a shadow like the sun, it'd be a lot harder. But let's say that your star dial looked like a tube pointed at where Sirius would be when it crossed the middle of the sky. And let's say you say, my noon is when Sirius is in the center of the sky. Well, <clears throat> if you've been paying attention to this whole four minute difference, you might realize that eventually those two people are gonna have the same noon because there'll be a time when Sirius crosses the center of the sky in the middle of the day. But there'll be another time, like in the winter, when it crosses the middle of the sky in the middle of the night. And this, I know I'm going, I'm beating around the bush for a reason. I'm hoping to buy time for somebody to figure this out before I give you the answer. But have you ever heard that the day is 24 hours long? But yes. that is not actually how long it takes the earth to spin once. The earth, for it to make one complete rotation on its axis, takes, wait for it, 23 hours and 56 minutes. What's missing? Four minutes. Four minutes. Ah, so here's the deal. If you were counting time just based on the spinning of the earth, then if you waited for the earth to make one full rotation, the sun would not be back to the center of the sky. So let's say you started at solar noon one day and you wait for the sun to return. 
but somebody tells you that the earth takes 23 hours and 56 minutes to spin. So you, instead of looking at the sun, you use a clock and you say, starting now, click, 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 click. You start counting time at that solar noon. The next day, when 23 hours and 56 minutes is up, the sun will not be quite back to that position. You'll have to wait extra time for it to get there. But I thought the earth spun exactly once in 23 hours and 56 minutes. What part of the earth am I forgetting? This is where I wish I had one of those little, di little handy models in my hand right now. But is the earth only spinning or is there another movement that the earth is doing too? Tilting. Tilting. Mm, not that. I know a lot of you are, are thinking that it's the seasonal change. But it's not that. In fact, if our axis was not tilted at all, this phenomenon would still be true. We just wouldn't have any seasons. Let me get that out of the way. If the axis was perfectly perpendicular to our orbit, every day would be fall or spring. There would be no summer. There would be no winter. Every day would be September 20th or March 20th. If you don't like the weather in March or September in Vermont, then you probably should be glad that we have that. Say that again. Spinning and going around the sun at the same time. Yes. Okay. So there's two things going on. We have to account for the fact that the earth is spinning, but that takes 23 hours and 56 minutes. But then the sun won't be back in the place where it was before. So because the earth has moved around the sun, and actually this is an easy thing to think about because in ancient Greek times, they used to think that the year was 360 days long. And that's why people like Euclid, the people who made up our geometry that we study, they decided to break up a circle into 360 degrees. And even though it's actually 365 and a quarter, for our purposes today, it's still close enough to accurate to say that the, the Earth, if you think of the Earth's orbit as a big, almost circle, an ellipse, the earth is going about one degree per day around the sun, right? Like think of the clock minutes going by, right? One degree per day, but it's also spinning. So if you were just counting the spin, you would say that it takes 23 hours and 56 minutes for the earth to reset its spin. But because the earth also moved a degree, then the earth has to spin just a little bit more, four minutes more, to get the sun back into the same position. So if you wanna have a solar clock, you say the day is 24 hours long. But if you wanna have a sidereal clock, a star clock, then you would say the day is 23 hours and 56 minutes long. And that four minute difference is caused by the fact that the earth is also moving around the sun. And that means that if Arcturus is rising tonight at 8 p.m., tomorrow night, it'll rise at 7.56. And then the next night it'll rise at 752 and the next night it'll rise at, at 748 and so on and so forth. And that's the same with everything. So to make all of this make sense, remember Sirius is out at night tonight, but do you guys remember where Sirius is in the sky during the summertime? Remember the dog days of summer? Any of you remember that from our other time? So, if you were the astronomer that made the clock run on the sun, then you would say the day is 24 hours long. But remember the person, the, the nocturnal astronomer that wanted to make it based on the star Sirius? They would be pretty confused to be out there in the middle of the day looking for Sirius and they couldn't find it because Sirius would be in the middle of the sky with the sun at the same time in July. So right now it's in, at night. Later on in the year, Sirius will be out during the day. And that's because of that sidereal time, that four minute difference between the, the sun and the stars. Solar time versus sidereal time. And I know this is a lot of terminology and it seems a little annoying sometimes when you think about these little tiny fussy details. But to me, these little fussy details are what reveal the beauty of all of this astronomy. It is like clockwork. And that little tiny complication in the clockwork is still not that complicated that you can't put your mind around it. But, you know, thinking about Venus moving like a roller coaster when it's really our movement that's causing that effect, you have to remember, and this is something that goes all the way to modern physics like Einstein, 
is that all of us are observing from a, a subjective point of view. You might think you're objective, but you forget you're living on a moving planet. And that was where the whole relativity thing that Einstein was talking about, that when we talk about something, we always assume that we are the fixed point and that thing is moving relative to us, but we are moving too. All of us are moving. So whenever you measure speed, you're always measuring it relative to yourself, not to some absolute fixed point, because the more you understand the universe, there's nothing that is sitting still in this entire universe. Everything in this universe is moving really fast. In fact, to not be moving is like the same energy-wise as being dead. So be glad that we're all on a spinning planet going 67,000 miles around the sun and the sun itself is moving around the center of our galaxy and the galaxy itself is not even sitting still, but moving through an ever-expanding universe that is growing larger every second. Well, there's a lot for you guys to think about, but we're about five o'clock. So if you could fit all of that inside your brain, all of that to me is what is revealed by that little tiny four minute difference between the day, the sun calendar and the sun clock and the star clock. And so just think about that over the next week. Think about all the different ways that we measure time. Think of the ancient Mayans thinking that Venus and the sun and the moon were all important to understanding time and why that culture focused on Venus so much and other cultures, eh. It's just a pretty light in the sky, but they didn't make their entire culture based around it. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to wrap it up now, unless anybody has any questions. But I wanted to tell you something that I forgot to mention earlier, that Venus has a beautiful name in the Abenaki language. That's the language of the first Vermonters. So that should be the, you know, the nice way to end this today. If you all can say this with me, Masatwa. Masatwa is the Abenaki name for the planet Venus. So just think about the fact that if you look at Venus tonight and you say Masatwa when you're looking at it, you'll be saying the word that's been used to describe that light in the sky here in Vermont for thousands of years. It's pretty cool to connect yourself to all those people who've lived here before. But other than that, unless you guys have any questions, I'm gonna have to say goodbye and check out that website that I put in the chat so you can check out the meteor showers that are coming up. Bye. I oh, I miss you guys. It's so nice to hear your voices. And uh, I, can't, I can't wait to have our ice cream party someday in the <laughs> indefinite future, but I won't forget. <laughs> Us too. <laughs> Thank All right, you so and, much, uh, Bobby. And, and Rainy and Rose and Margarita, if you need help with your telescope, of course, don't hesitate to contact me. Um, Thanks tonight, a lot. tonight would probably be a waste of uh, time with the weather, but <laughs> we'll, we'll have some clear skies soon. And the rest of you, I still have a couple more telescopes available. I know it's getting a little difficult. Um, nowadays, we're asked not to uh, see each other, but if somebody really wants a telescope, we could probably arrange a way to safely get it to you. I'll just have to spray things down with Lysol, but we'll be all right. So. Bye. Thanks a lot. Right. Bye. 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 Thank you. Bye, Lisa. Bye. Thank you for doing such a great job. Bye. Bye, Bye everyone. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Now I got to get inside and get some cocoa. <laughs> Bobby, can I ask a quick question? Sure, please. Um, we were gifted a really nice telescope and we have no idea how to use it. Is there like a website or something that we could learn how to use this thing? I, I, I haven't looked, but I, I, I can guess and bet that YouTube is probably filled with videos that could help you. But at the same time, if you ever uh, need help and you get stumped and you can't find help online, okay. uh, you can contact me and maybe we can set up either a Zoom or a FaceTime okay. and awesome. I can walk you through it. Awesome. Thank you. That's great. I'm happy to do that for you guys. So anybody can take, if anybody else has a telescope and they need help, let me know and we'll help you as soon as we can. Awesome. Thank you. Can I ask one more question? I don't want to freeze you any longer. No, um, it's okay. <laughs> we, we meant to do your, your class today at 11. We were really looking forward to it. Is that one going to be accessible? On Everything is being archived. So it is? okay. Yeah, and I forgot to ask you if any of you watched the tree ID video, but we could talk about it next week, perhaps. Uh, uh, but yeah, that video, both the video uh, that I posted last week uh -huh. and today's live Q and A uh, was on that. The, the today's Q and A was only about fifteen minutes long, partly because okay. my internet connection yes. mysteriously disappeared. Okay. But it, you know, it, it, I did talk about a couple of other plants and trees, so it's worth watching. You might, yeah. you know, learn something else too. We would love that. Okay. Well, thanks for watching and I miss you guys. So I can't wait to see you again and have ice cream. Maybe not today. Go get warm. <laughs> if it was today, we'll have a hot soup instead. Exactly. <laughs>